Okay, hi there, and uh, welcome to a quick synoptic revision video looking at some of the possible micro and macro economic effects of a cut in university tuition fees. Background, a little bit of background for you that uh, tuition fees initially came in in 1998. Uh, they were initially £1,000 per year, paid up front, introduced by the Labour government. They increased to £3,000 in 2006 and a system of variable deferred fees and tuition loans. Student loans was introduced. The big change was, of course, in 2012 when the tuition fee cap was raised to £9,000 per year. It's edged a little higher now to £9,250. Initially, when the government brought the cap in or they, they lifted it to 9000 they were hoping they would essentially create a market in fees where universities would compete with each other uh, by different courses and by different uh, situations. In the event, nearly all the universities charge the maximum fee. There's, there's, there's virtually no competition by price. Most of the competition now seems to be by conditional and conditional offers. Uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, the IFS, recently have calculated that students from modest financial backgrounds, the poorest families, will typically accrue a debt of over £57,000 a year from a three-year degree course. Not just tuition fees, of course, but living costs have to be factored in as well, in particular the high cost of student rented accommodation. So in a synoptic question, you just have to think micro and think macro. You have to make that little dividing line between it. So what could be some of the micro and macro effects of cutting tuition fees? Let's say the Orga report suggesting they should cut them to £7,000 a year or something, quite a significant cut. Well, one is the impact on the individual choice about whether or not to go to university. The individual student thinking about their own costs and benefits, the internal costs and benefits, falling tuition fees could tilt the cost-benefit decision uh, towards more people applying for higher education and perhaps fewer people deciding to go down the vocational route, including apprenticeships and leaving school at 18, leaving college at 18 and finding full-time work. It could also impact at a micro level on access to higher education for relatively poor households. Another avenue you could go down on the micro side is to think about the market failures associated with education and degrees. In particular, debate, analyse and then debate the extent of positive externalities from taking different types of degree social benefits greater than the private benefits. Microeconomics could also focus on the individual universities. What kind of revenues are they going to generate? Or what courses can they offer? Uh, how many students can they, they offer places to, etc.? The financial sustainability of some universities has been called into question in recent times, particularly those who've borrowed heavily to expand their facilities and expand their accommodation, uh, but they've seen a fall in student numbers. When you're talking about the macroeconomic effects, of course, you try to broaden the whole debate out to think about big macro things, you know, jobs, competitiveness, all that kind of stuff. So will a fall in tuition fees impact on the number of overseas students coming to the UK um, to study? Uh, if, more, if more domestic students decide to go to university, does that reduce the number of overseas students? What about the medium term consequences for the human capital of the labour force? which might have a consequences for labour productivity, occupational mobility, employability, and that's the long run competitiveness of the economy, including uh, the links between higher level degrees and innovation in different industries. What about the consequences for the labour force, for unemployment, particularly if more people choose to delay their entry into the labour market? And crucially, think about the impact on inequality, the distribution of income, uh, most Typically, most graduates earn a premium uh, income over their lifetime compared to people who don't have a degree, although that does vary quite a bit by, by subject. So that might have an impact on inequality. What about the consequences, for example, for government revenue in the long term if more people decide to take degrees? Or if more people take degrees, will that depress the relative earnings of graduates? Either way, you just need to think micro, think macro. It's just the key part of this exam is to have something to say on the micro side and something valid to discuss on the macro side. A little bit of data here. Uh, the average student debt over £50,000 now, but typically £57,000 for poor students, particularly after the grants were cut. Uh, of course, th this idea of you, you pay back your student debt once in work 
And in reality, what you repay each year, and in total, depends on what you earn after university. So what kind of job you get. Typically, at the moment, you pay 9% of any earnings over £25,070 a year, I think, for 30 years. And if the debt isn't repaid by that point, the debt is written off. So really quite important to think about the long-term consequences. You can see on the green side here that student debt in England has absolutely surged from about 35 billion to well, nearly 90 billion, whereas debt in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, okay, a smaller student population, but of course tuition fees there are either zero for Scottish students at Scottish universities or much, much lower. So a huge level of student debt is, is a big issue there. How do we evaluate some of the points? You've got some micro points, you've got some macro arguments. Uh, well, lots of it, it depends on kind of things. There's a possible fall in university fee income if you go from 9250 to, let's say, 7250 So that might reduce the amount of money, the budget available to fund teaching and research. Universities might try to recover some of the revenues by increasing the rents they charge on, on their own student accommodation. There could actually be a shift away from domestic student course availability towards accepting more students from non-EU countries uh, who, who typically pay much higher overseas fees. Some universities may decide that if you cut tuition fees, that's the moment for them to become independent. I think the University of Buckingham is a good example there. So they might decide to become independent of government finance and seek external funding, for example, through a long-term bond issue. Another way universities could respond to this is by cutting costs elsewhere. They might they might ditch some of the higher cost courses deemed to be un uneconomic. They may cut back in areas such as libraries, student counselling, student sports, etc., which can have consequences for well-being. A lot depends on, uh, if you cut tuition fees, a lot depends on how a reform system also is reformed in other ways. For example, the Auger report is suggesting that the maintenance grants should come back for students. I think £3,000 a year maintenance grants for all students on relatively low incomes. And the other big issue is to do with relative uh, relative gainers and losers from cutting tuition fees. Um, the biggest beneficiaries will typically be those highest earning graduates who are going to pay less for their three or four year course. Let's say twenty five, thirty thousand pounds. They may spend. They may pay ten pounds, ten thousand pounds less over four years, but they're going to be earning more over their life cycle. Economics, medicine, law, finance, those kind of areas typically are high paid, relatively high paid graduate jobs. So if you cut tuition fees, those people will gain because they have less debt and they'll repay it more quickly anyway because of the earnings. So big debates about, uh, uh, about progressivity and regressivity if you decide to cut tuition fees. Topical issue, it has micro and macro implications and certainly worth thinking about as, as preparation for the exam.